My name is David Malone. I'm rector of the UN University, which simply means that I'm the head of the UN University system. We're headquartered in Tokyo, and we're coming to you today online from Tokyo, where we have a wonderful guest, Emilia Perez, who is the finance minister of East Timor, uh, who leads a group of conflict-affected, fragile, uh, developing countries, the G7+. Plus. Uh, she has tremendous experience herself of trying to reconstruct an economy that was very much war affected. And when you've been war affected, it lasts. It doesn't just stop overnight. And perhaps she'll tell us something about that. Uh, she was born in East Timor, but she moved to Australia as an exile, as a refugee, in effect, when she was a teenager, studied statistics helpfully for a finance minister uh, in her first degree. Later, in the middle of her public career, she returned to school, went to the LSE for a master's degree. Um, she worked at first at the World Bank on uh, Palestinian development. But when uh, the acute phase of crisis in her country broke out, she wanted to return. She did. She joined the transitional administration in her country uh, under UN auspices. But very rapidly, that transitional administration turned into an autonomous government of uh, East Timor, or Timor-Leste as it is now known, and uh, became very involved in planning. In 2007, she became the finance minister. Emilia, welcome to UNU. You were kind enough to meet with our students this afternoon to do a public event this evening. And this is an opportunity for our viewers online to spend a few minutes with you here. Um, I wanted to ask you about the particular challenges of being a finance minister in a country emerging from conflict, and what you think other countries emerging from conflict or at risk of conflict have in common with each other. Well, I, it was a, a very big challenge. I think if I uh, go back, you know, for the seven years, uh, I, what I found was a dysfunctional ministry. I, uh, we had to face the uh, capacity deficit in human resources. The, 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 uh, at the time, there was a study made in my uh, Ministry of Finance. 60% of my, uh, the, the, the workers there had third grade in numeracy. Now, can you imagine with that type of capacity, how can you actually make a, a ministry function? So we, we had to go through, we had to go through many, many reforms, but we had to break down everything and had to understand. And then the other, the other challenge I found was the culture. Mm. You see, because I came from, I was trained in Australia. I was used to the modern management and I was very much result-oriented, client-service type of culture. And when I kind of issued that and said, listen, the reforms are going to be based on that, they looked at me and said, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. But it took me like three to four years to get that new culture embedded mm. in the people. But once it did, it's like, it's, it's just incredible. You can see everybody blossoming. Because the other thing that I, I realized is people have talent. Mm. You just have to go and dig it and dig it to find out. And where their talent is, uh, is so that you can put the right person in the right job. Mm. Now, that's a huge, big exercise. It's not easy. But you have to have patience to do that. And uh, many, many countries uh, uh, don't do it. Because often, uh, when you are in crisis, there is a lot of development partners out there helping you. But everybody is rushing. People think that in two, three years, you can build an institution. You can build a public service. That's not right. You really have to be there for the long duration. And you need to uh, pay attention to the details. Break down every little concept. Mm. Because people are coming from different backgrounds. And you have to understand that. Mm. Very often, they're not doing it on purpose. It's a mistake or they misunderstood. They just don't understand you. 
So you try and try and try. And I, I actually am very proud of my ministry because after seven years, uh, on the sixth year, the ministry is now functioning without me. Mm. I, I don't spend much time in, in my country nowadays, mm. so I can afford to actually uh, uh, be involved in the uh, Liturgy 7 Plus, which is looking after 18 countries, how to help them get out of fragility. And that's only because the reforms in my country are now working, and the ministry is working without the minister. Although it's hard to imagine you don't have an impact in the ministry, whether you're physically there or not. Yeah, well, you know, we use a lot of technology mm -hmm. we, uh, to, to, to overcome the, the deficit in, in human capacity. We used, we automatized many things so that the, the uh, calculations of all these numbers were done automatically in the system. And then the system itself is designed in such a way to, to be in compliance with the existing laws of the country. So that if someone doesn't understand the law, they cannot move because when they want to process a payment, the system will say, have you done the, the commitment? Mm. If you haven't done the commitment, you can't go get to the payment. Mm. So, we have to do all that stuff, take advantage of modern technology to bypass and overcome these obstacles and then afford to be able to deliver the service to our clients. Having heard you earlier today, I also got the impression from you that you had supportive colleagues in the government around you. The Prime Minister and others supported you strongly. And I think often finance ministers are quite lonely in their capitals in trying to apply sound management to government? Well, uh, I had full support of Prime Minister. Mm. Not so much from my <laughs> colleagues. <laughs> we are normally looked at as the enemy, mm. to the point of people think that we are opposition within mm. the government itself. Mm. Because the Ministry of Finance, our normal, you know, the favorite word is no, no, no. Mm. You know, before they come, we go no, mm. because everybody wants more money mm. to do a lot of things, and we say, hey, the, the money that you already have, you can't even implement it mm. because it's they. You know, people think that just by asking for more budget, uh, that things are going to be sorted out. The problem is that to do budget execution, they have to follow a lot of regulations. Yes. And when they do that, automatically it delays a lot of processes. But not because you are delaying it because of bureaucracy, it's just mm. because you, you're dealing with public money. Mm. Public money has many, many uh, regulations that has to be abided by because it's not your money. Mm. So you have to do procurement and the procurement process takes a few, uh, you know, it has its own time frame. and. Uh, People have to do checks and balances, mm. then reports, etc., etc. It's not easy. Mm. So now you've become a major international figure in the process of, I think, particularly your years as finance minister, and you've become a spokesperson for the fragile states, the ones whose group uh, you lead. You were invited by the Secretary General of the UN to participate in the high-level panel on the post-2015 development framework. And I wanted to ask you what you've been advocating within that group, what you think really matters for the G7 plus group of countries. Yeah. Well, the G7 plus came about because we were starting to talk about the Millennium Development Goals. And we found that most of us are not going to achieve any of those goals by the due date, which is 2015. So questions were starting to be asked, why not? And then when we analyzed our actions throughout all these past years, we found out that it's not that we were not working, we were doing quite a few, uh, implementing a few programs and doing other things that had to do more with peace building and state building rather than MDGs, mm. because these are the preconditions. A country cannot immediately work on service delivery without the institutions. A country cannot build an institution without peace 
and stability. Mm. So that's what we found out. And then we found out that in the global development agenda, there were no uh, uh, goals or indicators to measure these actions. And therefore, every time we, we were being measured, we were being measured against MDG. So we looked like failures. Mm. And we thought, no, we're not failures. If I got stability in my country and I'm starting to get administrative functioning, that's a lot of work. Mm. But nobody's counting that as part of the development process. And so we came up with what we call the PSGs, Peace Building and State Building Goals. And we are saying that if people adhere to this, you know, the, the, the um, political inclusiveness, you know, allow everybody to have a say, uh, security, uh, uh, some sort of access to justice, create jobs, and then manage better your revenues so that you can deliver the service. If you do these five big goals, and you could say five priorities, then the chances of you going back to conflict is reduced. Yes. And that is what I have been promoting and advocating within that high-level panel. Well, I think very successfully, because if you'd asked me three years ago, whether issues of peace and security would be discussed by a high-level panel on the post-2015 development framework, I would have predicted not. Because in the UN, uh, there has always been a big separation between debates on development and debates on security. And somehow you managed, with help perhaps from some others on the panel, to bring these together really for the first time in many ways. Well. I was very surprised that there were people who thought I, I, that uh, you should separate them. Because mm. on the ground, you cannot separate them. You really have to work. Like, I am a finance minister. I finance uh, budgets, mm. right? I give budget to the health ministry. I give budget to education. But every time there's a crisis, the budget cannot be executed. Mm. Obviously, then I had to focus on the security sector give them more money to see if they can actually make sure that peace and stability is in the country. Then I could see the others start to move in, like the agriculture, like education and health. So it, it was too interlinked. Mm. It, the, the two goes hand in hand. Whereas I think in the past, in the UN, it had been seen as a zero-sum game. If security gets money, it means development doesn't get money. So many people were against security being part of the agenda. I think it's a great success that in the debate now, these issues of peace building, of secure, basic security, are part of the mix. It's one of the great contributions of the high-level panel. I wanted to ask you about a couple of things uh, I noticed in the panel's report. One was uh, the recognition of a degree of success in development. In the past, in a way, there was a reluctance to recognize that developing countries were beginning to develop effectively because there seemed to be a fear that if there was success, there would be no more support for development. So that was one important shift. <coughs> The other, which is less explicitly recognized, is that uh, many countries have been quite successful on quantity, quantity of children in school, quantity of vaccinations, and so on. But some of the concern now is shifting to quality of services, what you get in school, what you learn, and so on. I wanted to ask you about that, what your sense of that debate amongst members of the, the panel was. Well, I, 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 didn't, uh, I, I did not become aware that there was a reluctance to be developed, because in our minds, that's, that's our dream, mm. to be developed. Mm. So you should be proud of mm. saying, hey, I'm developing, and, and I'm moving on. Mm. Uh, towards uh, a certain developed uh, phase. Uh, but uh, the, the issue of quality, uh, yes, I was very aware of that because, uh, and this happens in my country, you know, you, you can send as many students to school, but then at the end they cannot read and write what is the point. Mm. So we needed to get back to what are the real indicators that should be measuring development. And what do you mean by development? Mm. You know, it's just not a matter of, he can go to school. Mm. 
Mm. But then he doesn't do anything. Mm. Or then you've got a teacher that does not know how to teach. Yeah. And therefore the child is never going to learn. Because the bottom line, you go to school to be educated. And what does that mean? It means you need to know how to read, you need to know how to write, you need to understand mm. things. So for us, uh, we learn that from practicing on the ground. And so when the conversation came about that quality is important, uh, I was all for it because, I mean, how, how do you argue against that? But it is, I think, in a wonderful way, a sign of progress because 30 years ago or 40 years ago, just getting the kids into school was a big problem and other very basic development goals were difficult to achieve then. Whereas now, it's not like we have luxury problems. They're still quite basic problems. But we have been successful, in other words, the developing countries have been successful at some of the goals they set themselves back then, allowing uh, their countries to move on to other goals now. I think it's important to always have uh, a, a reference point, because mm. we forget very easily. Mm. You know, like every year things move, and now with this technology, you know, in the age of technology, things move really fast. Mm. And we completely forget that a few years ago we did not have emails. Mm. You know, sometimes we think, how could I communicate? And this is like overnight mm. you communicate. And in the past, when the fax machine came, I was overwhelmed. Mm. Uh, and uh, now it's it's even it's just incredible. But we should really have that point of reference so that we can see how far we have come. Mm. But sometimes we forget and we should be reminded of. Mm. And I, as a minister of finance, I like to have that point of reference because mine is like seven years ago, my finance minister couldn't execute the budget. Yeah. And today, and that was like at that time, there was the budget was only like three hundred million dollars. And the maximum we could execute was 160 million. Today, the budget is over a billion do uh, dollars, and they are executing over a billion dollars. The same kind of people. Mm. So, uh, in fact, I'm actually trying to document this so that we do not forget mm. the process that we went through, because it's important uh, to the people that were there every day working in that area. Okay, that's fine for them. But the others, you need to kind of bring everybody with you. Mm -hmm. And that's the important thing, like with the MDGs. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's been a great success. However, it did leave behind 1.5 billion people. Yes. Now, they are 20% of our world population. Now, we need to ask us this question, why were they left behind? Mm -hmm. And that's where we came in to being, you know, like we were doing this peace building and state building activities and it was not measured because everybody else was already okay and here you are those other countries, nobody was paying too much attention even though they were paying attention but the things that we were implementing were probably not being very effective. And this is why we are now in existence, the, the little G7 plus, to also remind the world, hey, we are still here, <laughs> and hey, do it this way, because yeah. I want to be part of it. Mm. I don't want to be just an object mm. for the, the, the developed world to think that they're going to you know, fix me up or whatever. I want to be part of the solution, because at the end of the day, it's me sitting out there. Well, I think the developed world hasn't done such a great job on itself recently, and so it's not necessarily in the best position to be telling other countries what they should be doing. I think the donors are at their best when they simply support what actors within the countries they're trying to help want to do. Uh, that seems to work best. And this comes to, brings us to the other a question of trust. Mm. Sometimes there's just not enough trust mm. to trust this country to do the right thing. Mm. Uh, and I think donors has a huge big uh, dislike of mm. taking risks. Mm. And I keep telling them, listen, you want to engage in a fragile state? Mm. <laughs> there's yeah. no chance. Mm. Just pretend you are an investor. Investor takes risk. Yeah. The bigger the risk, the bigger the return. Mm. That's, that's normal. Mm. That's like uh, 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 logic. So start getting into this mindset, eh? then maybe you can start seeing things improving. Uh, and then the other thing, 
I've always been a great believer, you know, when I was first driving and uh, learning how to drive a car, yeah. the, the teacher that I was looking for is the one that was also learning how to drive. Yeah. That was a better <laughs> teacher. Because every time they learn something, they would say, oh, don't do it this way, do it that way. It was clear. Because the other one that drives very well already, they make a lot of assumptions. <laughs> and they don't even know that. Yes. And the same thing, you apply that same thing to country uh, like ours. For example, Timor-Leste has a lot of lessons because we just kind of got out of conflict. Yeah. So it's still fresh in our memory mm. what to do. And I try to articulate this to the donors. I said, listen, when I speak, I'm not speaking because of uh, theory. Mm. I'm speaking because we went through it. It's you know, hands-on, practical stuff. That's how we did it. It may not work with the other country, but let's discuss it and let's see whether they think they, they, this applies to them. And also, in your case, in conclusion, it's very recent. Timor Leste's very brave struggle for through a very difficult period of post-colonial rule, uh, some violence, uh, quite a lot of repression pre-independence. Pre it's all quite recent, so I think around the world everybody is rooting for Timor-Leste uh, to make it, and uh, prognosis is really good. So you're a wonderful spokeswoman, I think, mm -hmm. for uh, countries like yours, although there's no country that's exactly like yours, uh, and I hope you'll remain very heavily engaged in the debate until the post-2015 framework is set, yeah. uh, because it's still a big struggle ahead to get 194 countries to agree on only a certain number of goals, how to structure them, and then to mobilize resources, not just from the donors, but internally for things to happen. Thank you so much for being with us today, with our students, with our fellows, tonight with the public in Tokyo. We've been asking you to work very hard, and you've been a fabulous guest. Thank you very much, David. Thank, Thank you. you.